Welcome to another edition of uh, Experiencing the Gospel, the Experiences of the Gospel. Um, um, well, we're near the, near the end. We're in Romans chapter 8, and we've only got two messages to go. And we're making our way uh, through this book rapid, rapidly. Um, if you're go joining us for the first time, I would really encourage you to go back to the very beginning and catch up. You can, arc you can go to our archives uh, you can reach that through our web uh, site, uh, centralsarasota.org, and go back and catch up with this, because uh, you could jump in right now today, and I, if you're here, I encourage you to stay and listen, uh, but you will do well if you go back and get everything we've said up until this point. Uh, so what is the experience of the gospel? Well, the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. And the gospel is certainly to be believed and is certainly to be understood, but it also is to be lived, is to be experienced, is something that God has designed for us to step into. Uh, it becomes a part of our life and not just simply um, an academic pursuit on our part. Romans is the most complete explanation of the gospel in the whole New Testament. And it is um, a wonderful book to explore the many, many aspects of the gospel. And what I've tried to do in, in the writing of this material is to take those concepts that are found in the book of Romans and weave my life into those concepts so that you can see a little bit how to apply them into your life. I'll tell some stories. I'll show some things that uh, help me uh, in, in certain illustrations helps me to understand the gospel better. Well, your job is to get your Bible and open your Bible to Romans chapter eight. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 30 today. And I would encourage you to uh, follow along in the text. And I won't be going verse by verse. I'm really going to be covering concepts. But I think if you read along with me in your Bible, you will get the sense of what I'm doing here and what I'm trying to explain to you. Uh, in the reading of what I've written here. So we're going to jump into our study today. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. I call this the big picture, the big picture. And hopefully you'll see why in just a moment. I will never forget flying over Greenland at 35,000 feet. I was so glad that it was daytime and I had a window seat. I cannot begin to describe the view. It was spectacular. I also flew over the Kalahara Desert in South Africa. It was just as barren as the ice sheets of Greenland. I will never forget flying into Haiti for the first time and seeing the treeless mountains. It looked so desolate. There is nothing like an airplane ride to give you the big picture of an area. Paul climbs to 35,000 feet in Romans 8, 18 through 30 to show us a cursed and groaning world filled with purpose in the midst of suffering. So let's explore. Man has always had trouble keeping suffering in perspective. Deprivation hurts. When my plane landed in Haiti, I saw that the treeless landscape was merely a mirror image of the lives of the people who lived there. The suffering was intense and systemic. It smelled. It groaned. Paul begins by making it clear that whatever temporary suffering we go through here will be offset by the glory that we will one day experience. Experience, indeed, is the word to use. We experience the suffering. I have not had to endure a great amount of suffering in my life. Life has had its moments. My arm hurt pretty bad when I broke it, practicing high jumping without a pit. I thought I would die in the, in the tobacco fields of South Georgia in the middle of the scorching summers. The glory was revealed in the ice-cold RC Cola at the end of each row, I learned the importance of hydration. 
Brenda experienced the struggle and the pain of childbirth five times to be re rewarded by five little bundles of joy to ease her pain. There are rainbows after the storm. There are paydays after the work. There are recoveries after the surgeries. Paul is telling us to look through the struggles we experience on the outside to the glory that is peeking out on the inside. It is a glory that will be revealed in us. It is there. It is waiting to come out. It is lurking in the shadows of the suffering. As Paul will say later in this section, there is the image of his son being formed in each of us. God is working. We have company in the struggles of life. All creation is struggling. Now don't get hostile with me, but I think the creation was moaning long before we thought of man-made climate change. Before Ford built the first internal combustion engine, the earth was struggling. In some way, we can blame all climate struggles on Adam. The Garden of Eden seemed to be doing great before Adam messed things up by sinning. Now, that's a new thought. What if we could stop the fires and the earthquakes and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the mudslides and the flooding and the depletion of the ozone layer by simply eliminating sin instead of carbon emissions? Well, let's start with the politicians. I mean, in the sin department. The earth is cursed. How are we supposed to save the planet when we cannot even save ourselves? The earth is waiting on us. But it is not waiting for us to all drive electric cars or have a windmill in our front yard. It is waiting on us to be revealed. It says it is waiting in eager expectation. What in the world does that mean? Well, we are children of God and we need to be revealed. Remember the righteousness of God in the gospel has been reveal, revealed, Romans chapter 1, 17. And remember the, the wrath of God has been revealed according to Romans 1 and verse 18. The time is coming when the children of God will be revealed. John put it this way. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we will know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as as he is pure. It is so easy to get focused on the wrong thing. Too many times we see a sky that is falling when we should be seeing the morning star rising in our hearts. 2 Peter 1.19 There is an outward decay of the earth and me, but there is an inward renewal. Paul's parallel passage to Romans chapter 8 is 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in the heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal might be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Now, I dare you to go back 
and read all of Romans chapter 8 and see how many matching themes and words you will find with the text that I just read, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. In other words, I'm challenging you to compare these two scriptures. The present world knows it is destined for destruction. Its liberation from its decay and suffering is connected to our liberation. The seeds of resurrection reside in those who are in Christ. When, when, bapti when baptized, we rose to new life. It is inside of us. It will fully be revealed one day. We are, we are going to pop out of our cocoon, revealing a beautiful butterfly. I am not really clear on what God has in mind for this world when Jesus comes back. Some say it will be renovated and become like the Garden of Eden again. I'm not ready to take a position on that, but I know that the world will not remain as it is. And I know that if it does become the Garden of Eden again, it will not be because of the Paris Climate Accord. The solar panels on my roof are purely to make it possible one day for me to pay only $9 a month for my electric instead of $200. The transformation of the sun's rays through those solar panels into my inverter and into the wires of my house and into my appliances is nothing compared to the work of God inside of me. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate or reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but take a look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. The purpose of God is for us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now I want to pause right here and interject something that I didn't write. Just as the sun, the rays of the sun come and hit my solar panels, they are then they are then taken into this inverter that converts them into a form of electricity that then can be pumped into my house and can run my appliances within my house. And it changes the environment and changes my life. Think about how, how God's powerful rays through the gospel, how his light shines into my life and how God converts that into something that transforms me into the image of Christ. My respect for Brenda increased greatly when I watched her go through childbirth. I didn't have much experience with such things until January the 8th, 1978. Entering that delivery room and seeing the miracle of new birth was amazing. However, I will not forget the screams of the women in rooms near ours. Now, since Brenda had such a wonderful Lamaze coach, she was sailing through like a champ. Well, she might have a slightly different memory of this. There were some pretty loud groaning going on in that maternity ward. Paul says that the creation is in childbirth. So what do we expect of this world? Hurricane Katrina was a pretty big contraction. The 2010 Haitian earthquake was a huge contraction, leaving over 250,000 people dead. I saw the aftermath of this one. Cosmic birth pains are serious. Noah's flood was not due to climate change. Sodom's firestorm wasn't either. Somewhere in the world every day, there is a new contraction indicating that this world is trying to give birth to something 
new. Well, Paul returns to the idea of adoption in this passage. Here he seems to indicate that we will not be fully adopted until our bodies are redeemed. It is not unusual for Paul to talk of progressive realities. For instance, eternal life is a promise, but it, it is also a present re possession. We have everything we need for life and godliness, but we cannot even imagine what God has prepared for us. Being in Christ is great now, but it is going to get better. It is easy to see that this present body is holding us back from some pretty amazing experiences. The Bible allows us to see behind the curtain to the wonderful unseen world. I would love to step through the curtain and experience it all firsthand. Like Moses who wanted to see God but was only allowed to see his back, I long to see him face to face. We must wait for a new body with spiritual eyes to see God who is spirit. I don't think we appreciate expectation enough. In a day of instant gratification, we just want to lick the ice cream cone now. We think it is torture to be told at 10 a.m. that we will be taken to get ice cream at 8 p.m. You mean I have to wait 10 hours? Perhaps we should relish the 10-hour experience of thinking about ice cream. I want heaven now, but in the meantime, I like to dream about it. This is hope. Hope can only be experienced when we do not see what we hope for. When you get the ice cream, hope ceases. But isn't hope good? Shouldn't we savor hope? Can hope satisfy us? Of course, if hope is rooted in assurance. Hope in Christ is no pipe dream, going up in smoke. Christian hope is real. It is tangible. It is experience. When Jesus promises us something, it is as good as done. Perhaps we should get better at hoping. In the text, there are two kinds of waiting, eager and patient. Aren't these two contradictory? Well, they must not be. I can be eager for something and patient at the same time. That is delayed gratification. This is the big picture of our existence on earth. At age 10, I, was, I accepted Jesus as Savior and I was baptized into Christ. I accepted Christ's promise of eternal life and received a down payment of it when he gave me his Holy Spirit. At that moment, I became eager for heaven. At this writing, though I have been patient for 58 years for what I have hoped for, from time to time, from the time I first knew Brenda to when we were married was about six years. We were dating for three years. We were engaged for a year and a half. You bet I was eager for her to be my wife. You bet she made sure I was patient in my eagerness. And this is the nature of hope. Some people just don't like living in the big picture. They seem to want a series of little pictures snapshots of life. Hope says pull back the camera and get the panoramic view. Move your setting to landscape. To pan means to catch it all. Too many are grabbing some when they could wait and have it all. They think by doing so they can avoid the suffering. Well, as Garf says, I could have missed the pain but I would have missed the dance. Life is a dance with God, a slow dance. So what is the Spirit doing while we are waiting and suffering and decaying and hoping? Well, He is helping us. He knows we are weak. He knows hope is hard. He knows we will get impatient 
and want what we want now. James says, we have not because we ask not. And when we ask, we just want something to satisfy our short-term desire to give us pleasure. That's a paraphrase from James chapter 4. The truth is, is that we just don't know what to ask for. We have trouble forming our prayers. We either don't pray or we ramble. Our thoughts are all over the page. A woman in childbirth is not always rational, especially in transition. We are that woman in childbirth. We need a coach to tell us and God what we really need in the moments when prayer is difficult. Often our prayers are no more than inarticulate groans. What did you say? Ugh, help me. The Holy Spirit comes to the rescue. Well, what he's trying to say, God, is, is that he's hurting and he needs your comfort and guidance. But even the Spirit groans. In the next text, there are three, or in the text, there are three groans. The creation, me, and the Holy Spirit. It is a literal course of groans. God hears the groans of his people in Egypt, and he sent a Moses amidst the plagues to deliver them. He heard Paul and Silas singing in prison amid their groans, and he sent an earthquake to deliver them. He heard the groans of Jesus on the cross, and he sent death to put an end to it all. It is finished. He hears our groans, and he sends his Spirit to interpret what we want according to his own will. The Holy Spirit is a translator. He knows our thoughts and God's thoughts. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and following says, The Spirit searches the deep things of God and puts them into spiritual words that we can understand. In the same way, He searches out the deep things of man and puts them into spiritual words that God will understand. Most translators can only interpret your words to another. The Holy Spirit can interpret your thoughts. In my personal experience, it is a little disconcerting when someone likes, like my wife seems to know what I am thinking and feeling even when I have no words to describe my inner experience. Brenda and I sometimes sing the Keith Whitney song, You say it best when you say nothing at all. The Holy Spirit says, it's be says it best when we say nothing at all, when we merely groan. The text says three minds come together in perfect harmony. Mine, the Spirit's, and God's. This perfect harmony of thought is priceless. Psalm 139 should be read at this point. So why not turn over there and read it? Well, you might want to wait till after the uh, video is over. But go back and read Psalm 139 about how well God knows us. You're going to find a litany of statements that demonstrate how thoroughly God knows us. He heard our gurgles in our mother's womb. We gurgled before we groaned. Jesus demonstrated on several occasions that he knew what people were thinking before they spoke a word. The Holy Spirit is a mind reader. The aim of the Spirit is for everything to be brought into alignment with the will of God. All our random thoughts must be corralled and encircled by the will of God. Left to ourselves, our thoughts run wild. They are chaotic and disor disordered. The Holy Spirit reigns them in and brings them under the control of God. We looked at this in the first part of Romans chapter 8. It is a mind controlled by the Spirit. The Spirit desires the will of God. He is working in us 
to cause our desires to be according to the will of God. The word accordance means in harmony with or in agreement with. When we say amen, we mean we agree with what has been said. The Holy Spirit reframes our prayers in accordance with the will of God so that when we say amen, we are all three in agreement. Intercessory prayer is about agreement. When I ask someone to pray for me, I want them to agree with me as to what I need. We often do this when we get people to sign a petition. There is strength in numbers. Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you agree, on earth agree, about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. The issue is alignment. And that is where Romans 8, 28 comes in. Romans 8, 28 is one of the most familiar passages in Romans, perhaps in the entire New Testament. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But that's not how I learned it. The King James says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you see the difference? Look carefully. In the NIV, it says God works. And in the King James, it says all things work. The King James make it, makes it sound like whatever happens was supposed to happen in order for things to work out. But more accurately, the NIV made it clear that it is God who works in all things, in whatever happens, without implying that he caused all things to happen. In one case, God is stringing events along to make things come out for our good. But in the other case, God is merely working in whatever might happen, for whatever reason, for our good. God doesn't cause everything that happens to happen. God is capable of working in and through everything that happens. There is a big word for this. It's called providence. One source explains providence as the foreseeing care and guidance of God or nature over the creatures of the earth. It indicates that we're not alone. There is a song in our books that give us this theme. And frankly, it kind of spooks me out. It's simply named Watching You. Here are the way, here are the, way the lyrics go. All along on the road to the soul's true abode, there is an eye watching you. Every step that you take, this great eye is awake. There is an eye watching you. Watching you, watching you, every day mind the course you pursue. Watching you, watching you, there's an all-seeing eye watching you. I think it was the idea of a single eye in the sky watching me that kind of freaked me out. Romans 8.28 should give us great assurance that there is someone, and not just anyone, who works on our behalf. The deist of the likes of Thomas Jefferson did not believe that God is involved personally with his children. Jefferson discounted the miracles of the Bible because they indicated that God was intervening, intervening in the affairs of men. It was difficult to believe that God is sitting in the driver's seat with us, helping us steer the buggy. But to be fair to Jefferson... We all have trouble understanding the line between God's work and our work. Who is responsible? Who is driving the vehicle? If God is at work, why do any of us end up in the ditch sometimes? 
Well, once I was barreling down that South Georgia dirt road between my house and Dasher, when I came to the big curve, as we called it, it was fun to slide the car around the curve, pretending to be on the Daytona Speedway. On one occasion, I met an oncoming car in the middle of the curve. My only choice was to swerve into the woods on the side of the road, and I barely missed a big pine tree. But I wasn't out of the woods yet. The other car stopped, and four big football players who happened to be black, remember, this was 1970, stepped out of their car and headed toward me. Well, I couldn't blame them for being mad. I could have killed them. Instead, they offered to push my car out of the woods. Was there an all-seeing eye watching me? Was I providentially spared? That's the hard part. I'm not sure. Just because I do not always know the role God plays in all things does not mean that he is not playing a role in all things. The text is not done. There are two qualifiers given. He does good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. The way I have always looked at the, of this part of the text is that if I want God to be working for me in all things, then my part is to love him and to be about his purposes. Well, why should I expect God to work on my behalf? If I hated him, or at least ignored him, why would I expect God to work for my good if I cared little or nothing for his purpose for my life? I look at it like this. If I want God to be part of my daily life, working to help everything come out for my benefit, then I want to prove to him that I love him and that I am walking according to his good purpose for my life. I am thankful that I don't have to figure out all of this on my own. His purpose for my life is spelled out in Romans 8, 29 through 30 in some detail. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So let's go to the heart of the purpose for our lives. His purpose is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. That's it. All the other words in this passage tell us how he accomplishes that. Let's start by focusing on conforming to the image of his son. The idea of conforming is comparable to being molded or shaped. Image or imagine a potter conforming the clay to a certain image. He has in mind what he wants the container to look like. The clay has to respond to the potter's touch. The strings of a violin respond to a violinist's fingers. The keys on the keyboard are conforming to my touch. If I hit the right ones, out comes a, co a coherent thought so that what is in my head is on the screen. This is our purpose in life, for his life to be reproduced in us. I can tell you that this makes things so much simpler when we know this, when God is working for this purpose and I desire this purpose to be accomplished in my life, then we are in sync. So what are all those other words that proceed and follow this purpose? They include foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. I don't want to get too heavy with these theological concepts. But we need to see that God has a progression of steps, each of which is necessary to our knowing that he is at work in our lives. Think of these as connectors. 
A relationship has to be established in order for God to do his ongoing work in our lives. Let me get this out of the way from the start. We must not interpret any of these in a way that denies our free will. If our free will is not involved, then we would have no say in whether God works in our lives or not. It would, be like, it would all be on Him. We would have no choice as to, to being conformed to the image of His Son. It wouldn't matter if we understood these, these matters or not. Our cooperation would not be required. Perhaps it would be helpful to start in the middle and work back to the beginning and then work towards forward into the future. The one in which God works is someone that God has always known from the beginning. God can know things that he does not cause. I have witnessed two vehicles on a collision course and knew what was going to happen, but I didn't cause it. In this passage, the predestination is specific to God's purpose for our lives. God predestined that we be conformed to the image of his Son. He has already determined what our purpose is. God sets this. We can, we can decide not to cooperate with it. And since this is true, then the calling of God is a call to be conformed to, to the image of his Son. The calling cannot be different from the predetermined purpose of God. He invites us to be like Jesus. But in order for us to be like Jesus, we need to be justified. We need to be made righteous, cleansed from our sins, and redeemed by the blood of Christ. Without the acceptance of his atoning sacrifice, we cannot be conformed to his image. Looking forward we will one day be glorified. This is the crowning event of God's work in our lives. Because we are becoming like Jesus, we will one day share in his glory. Now this is the big picture of our relationship with God. These are the elements of the big picture. Certainly, when we get down to, to in the weeds on these concepts, we can get a little lost in the detail. What, what I do when this confusion sets in is to take my plane back up to 35,000 feet and get the overview. Too many people live their lives without the puzzle box. They will see all the pieces, they see all the pieces without the picture on the box. We still have to put the pieces together, but it sure is easier when I know what the whole thing is supposed to look like. And if you go back and look and read again, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 20, you're going to get a big picture of what things are supposed to look like in this spiritual realm in which we live. Both the creation of this world and where our suffering fits into that groaning and that suffering uh, where our, our suffering fits into this, into this picture of the glorification that will come one day, or whether it be how God works in our life to bring about the uh, image of His Son in, in our hearts, all of this is the big picture of how things work. So until next time, next time we'll finish up the experience of the gospel by looking at the last section of Romans chapter 8. Thank you for joining us. Go to our website, centralsarasota.org. You'll find all of the things we've recorded over the past year plus. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless.